Hey everybody, welcome to the Purpose People podcast. We've got Ross Matthews from Clarity and Connect. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So we changed the setup today, so it's a little bit <laughs> exciting or a bit of a change, but you're our first guest with our new look. Oh. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you for yeah, having me. It's great to have a cozy setup. I feel really honoured to have this nice little like uh, intimate feel. It's nice. So obviously we have unpack what your business is and what mm -hmm. it does or whatever, but in its sort of like straight, not answering too many more questions, you're a coach. Would that be a fair thing to yes. say? Yes, yes, indeed. So in your mind, what should a coach do? So from my perspective mm. and my understanding of what a coach should provide and in its short and in a nutshell, to be able to read between the lines of what their person, the client is saying. So they would say something that's a situation that's going on in their life or something they feel like they need to work on. And the coach is able to ask the questions that will deliver a message or a belief that they that has brought up that they're not seeing. Hmm. And then it's the coach's role to say, okay, I noticed this is happening. Would you agree? which opens up a new perspective for the client. Yeah. And that helps to deliver each session almost like with a direction or focus. And then when that could be just a conversation followed by other tools that you could use to use that, like, you know, classic tools such as word of life or mm. whatever that might be for them that will work for them. Because, But it also is quite unique or independent or just personal that you can say look what is the most adaptable for you because everybody's different right yeah. and i like to look at other alternative options and ways of doing it and I, my last client i noticed there's something i could put into my coaching you know and it could be a more creative way of doing something or what you, what i would call a bridge yeah which is the something that that distracts them that makes it feel not too intense for them yeah because coaching or any sort of therapy um or counseling or that might be it's quite a lot for someone to walk into for the first time yeah and what i found was if you got something that is like a bridge so for example i've opened up to a a play like playing cards i recently bought put some playing cards and we started just playing playing cards for the start of the session okay and it's lowered their um anxiety yeah and it's lowered their guard to go okay i'm not gonna you know it helps them to feel relaxed and yeah. they take off way and it's a lovely thing to do and you see them be the child again because initially when we go back to the inner child as well with some of the work we do we'll help them to understand why they have their behaviors mm. so um yeah if that, without answering your question too much until we get into it more that's my perspective but there's other things with that as well so yeah no i, yeah. I, I you know there is a lot of coaches out there and you know i think it has as much to do with the individual themselves finding the right right coach mm. rather than the coach being the right person for everybody mm. so for example there are some coaches that would work around clarity mm -hmm. or around purpose let's mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. and if that's what you need then that's the type of coach that you you know need to employ in your life mm. there are other coaches that are very goal driven and goal focused and results mm. maybe the sort of maybe the older world in a way, you know, like, you know, how many sales you're going to make, da 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 da, -da. <laughs> um, mm. And that's right for the right person. Mm. And I think sometimes we often flip it onto the coaches and say, well, you know, there's a load of decent coaches out there and there's a lot of dross out there. And mm. I argue and I go, well, actually, coaches would study as per a profession. They've got a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge on a particular area, but they might not be the right person for you. Absolutely. So you have a responsibility as a client to almost ask what type of coach do I want? Mm. Yeah, do I want a coach that's going to challenge me? Mm -hmm. Or do I hate that? <laughs> you know, um, And do I want a coach that's going to call out and say it like it is? Or do I want a coach that sugarcoats it? You know, uh, And it's understanding what type of coach that you actually want. It can even be male or female coach. You know, Do you want a female which is potentially a bit more nurturing in the way that mm. they think? Mm. Or do you want a guy that's a bit more principal, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the way they process information. And I think mm -hmm. we have a responsibility as a client to say what we actually want. Now, the argument would be, well, yeah, I've never done it before, which is what you're 
setting so you help people relax into it because it is almost an um how do i put it an unnatural conversation if you've done it for the first time absolutely because you're like who is this person and now yeah. i'm opening them up mm. um and obviously in the uk i think we still are an emergent nation in dealing with coaches and therapy and all that sort of stuff you know yeah. we're stiff up a lip is still where we're at yeah you know whereas in america it's quite a yeah quite a common practice you know you have your sports coach you have your mental health coach you have mm -hmm. your therapy mm -hmm. you have, they have all these extra things and they don't mind investing whereas in this country like oh don't worry i'll just get on with it you know, so it's a bit of a bit of a change yeah absolutely agree um this yeah so america's massive for it and so even new zealand australia they're really like in the health and wellness they're probably at the highest aren't they um been able to just have it repetitive mm. like if more you see something more we get used to it as a natural behavior more we get used to something more you see it i guess it's it just takes a lot longer yeah with with us and um yeah but i see it's definitely developing massively in the, the industry in lots of different uh like companies and different industries they're opening up to i can see on just like job applications come up with like coaches for well education for example um yeah. or they have lots of i see lots of um yeah applications and they're using the coaching whether it's a potentially a buzzword or actually they realize the the resource is actually really important to go into the open up some more no um, it's we we had someone simon potter's wife and he was yeah. he was on our on our um podcast and yeah he's essentially coaching teachers yeah which you know if you think of a profession that needs help the most yes where teachers feel the feel quite alone mm. having that resource or certainly from an academy decide to invest in coaches is a massive way forward yeah in them mm. keeping teachers in the profession number one and secondly making sure that they they're enjoying it just as much as you know the students are enjoying learning or yeah. if they're not enjoying learning what are the blockers to stop them and i think teachers always feel like they're fighting an uphill task and always bringing coaches in i mean it's brilliant yeah you know, so to simon's journey is quite a good journey because i look at that and i go that's what that industry needs a hundred percent yeah it really does like i work in schools myself and it is something that you see all the time and is you're, you're restricted being yeah. a teacher until you're able to look at other perspectives yeah perceptions so you know obviously when we look at sport for example that sport probably i would say in the last maybe 30 years of or maybe 25 years have moved from you know drinking down the pub and then just go out on the pitch and perform to really recognizing that the thing that sets the winners from the losers is mental health mm -hmm. and understanding their mindset needs mm -hmm. to be in a good place and yes the game has changed as a result of that so there's a lot more have you got the skills and talents ability to actually enter that arena 100 percent? but what keeps you there is obviously mindset mm. it's not all about talent and, mm. and stuff like that so seeing that in the education sphere is great but are there any other sort of industries where you've seen a bit of a shift in the last sort of like five to ten years where they become more open to coaching and, and, and engagement around that level i think there's been well my, I, my, I want to go into personally some the hospitality industry yeah um where they have such a high intensive work you know capacity it's yeah. always on the go and yeah. I feel that that there is a avenue there. Mm -hmm. Whether I think there might be already some opening up to coaching potentially, um, but I'm, I'm assuming it's it's at the moment. Yeah, education is a big one, and um, there is like corporate companies. They are realizing that actually their their staff members and their mental health and well being yeah. is something that they're opening up, or that might be accountancy. That might be. Um, could be yeah accountancy or something in a big corporate world they, they definitely do use that i definitely seen that um a lot of companies that are well-being companies that offer support and sport and exercise as part of it yeah. so essentially yeah they are um that's yeah i i think that i think what i've seen is a lot of a lot of companies that got large teams and now mm. a, another member of the team which is necessary not a a paid for service but they're supporting the existing team to perform yes are bringing in coaches and and people of that ilk yeah um i watch a tv show called billions 
mm-hmm. and they had a girl called Wendy in there who was always working with the traders, for example. So the traders are working at this sort of high level pinnacle, trying to get deals over the line, and mm. and yet you can't do that for a long period of time mm. without any support. So obviously they they could go knock on the door and have a conversation, and mm. she could unpick where they're coming from, their limiting beliefs, mm. the imposter syndrome, that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's it. And obviously managing them from the perspective of even if you're successful, how do you handle success? Because I think sometimes the coaches can also be around, we see it as a negative thing, that like there's a blocker and how do we get you around it? But mm. there's obviously when success comes is how you handle it as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like celebrating your wins and then not wanting to because you you want to win a few more before you do. You know, yeah. that, that sort of stuff. That's it, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit, Ross, about your background and how you ended up being a coach, because that's always an intriguing journey just yeah. to start at. So go for it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my background is in many different things. So um, I'm sure you know part of my story is I, I grew up not knowing who I am what, and what I wanted to do, being quite quiet as a young child. Um, and then when I discovered, you know, the world of work and everything, I so I don't want to go to college. So I went, went to go to college after I left secondary school and did carpentry. Fantastic. Some of my hands really enjoyed, but I wasn't quite quick enough, right? Yeah. And that was a rejection. So I did something else, went to work. And I worked probably two or three jobs at a time all the time because to just try and find the money. And from having, growing up into different work, I've had different experiences knowing about what I wanted to do. But everything never seemed to stick. Nothing stuck. So I've done, you know, another college. So I went and studied, studied counselling and mm-hmm. that was fantastic. I love that. And that was later in my sort of studies where I decided I wanted to go into working with people. Um, and then I worked in different worlds of like hospitality. That's a big thing I've done for a long time. And I worked in schools and education and special needs education and realising working with children has always been, been something I love to do. Mm-hmm. But it was, the, it was the need of wanting to be supported and helped and then for those that need that, that can, that requires my talent. And my talent was just purely just loving other people. Yeah. I just love conversation, talk, talking to people. I love to be able to find their best selves. Not knowing that at the time, just not conscious of that, just going through, I was really good at what I did because I was customer service based. Yeah. Those sort of jobs went really well. Um, following that, um, studying, studying um, counseling, I found coaching one of my modules and it sounds really interesting because yeah. i've got the training for how to into the process of counseling but then using coaching techniques and understanding how that worked I felt that can how i can really engage and get the best out of the client yeah so yeah. i went on that journey and through my self-development journey in the background of that realizing i've been coaching or coached for most of my life mm. mentors online you can get on youtube this is just like a fantastic resource yeah and then i had a one-to-one um also done my own i've been giving counseling and then i was giving coaching from um, america and then ireland and i just felt fell in love with this with this process yeah um and then i was trying to find who i was still because i still got all the you know had this experience and i've had the um coaching um and then realized so i had to go back to who i am and why i'm doing it in the first place and that came down from watching my my dad grow mm. up and knowing about his history um and just for context, you know, my, my watching my dad when I was at secondary school deal with mental health, he had a lot of um, hidden trauma and um, a, a really child, bad childhood. Right, so yeah. that was kept for a long time. And then obviously as, as you do as human beings, it builds and builds and builds. And fun, some, something will happen, whether it's a big or small event, and it, it would all pour out. And yeah. it, it did. He lost his job, made redundant, and everything came out. And then after that, every year, he became very depressed, and he came into chronic depression, and he went in and out of um, hospital, right. trying to um, end his life. And that was what I, what I witnessed. But I wanted to help him the whole time. Mm, that's interesting because because there is that there is that element of what you've just said there. I wanted to help fix him. So mm-hmm. do you think that is a key driver having? someone that you absolutely care about, wanting to fix them, it's mm-hmm. almost like you've got that compassion for others that has come as a result of that. Yeah, but feeling helpless was the hardest thing. 
Okay. Because you can have a conversation with him, but you know it's going straight over. You know, it's, it's not really sinking in. And, mm. you know, he feels, when someone feels so somewhat useless, because that's where they feel, um, there's no connection to what's going on and they're not conscious of what's going on. And they're just looking at it one way. Um, I didn't understand. So I always get frustrated. Yeah. And then I was like, I've just had a conversation with you. And next day he's doing something to end his life. Wow. I'm going, wow. Is that my fault? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Is that what? I, or is it? What, and I get angry, get annoyed, and you would go through these emotions. So I had to really understand what that all was. So that's why counseling came out, came around. That's why all these different things happened. And then moving forward, obviously, um, you eventually did get better. Great. Through mental health, and um, he got the training. Well, he got the counseling, and he went back into running because he was a runner. Okay. And um, that was great. You know, I thought great. That's all good. Um, but unfortunately he did pass away in, um, during, um, using, well, cause he had cancer. So that was unfortunately like, ironically, he wanted his life back and he saw value in his life again with running and yeah, yeah. his family, but his body beat him, you know? So, wow. That's sad. Eh? So, so from your perspective, you know, obviously you could see how it can make a difference mm. the counseling and the training and the sort of like which almost got a breakthrough but then obviously something left field came that you know essentially ended his life prematurely mm. but do you feel now knowing what you know now what would you what would you change about society would you knowing that, that there's people like your father there's a lot of people in that position mm that they would get access to something like this earlier on, do you mm. think? Is that, would, would that be something that come out of that? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's definitely something that needs to be normalized in a way, in a safe space and knowing how to, to be so accepting to it. Mm. And I do believe it's definitely on, on that journey now. Like the society itself are so familiar, so understood. They're aware of it. It's been able to still communicate that mm. in a way that it's like all right great so i appreciate that this has happened yeah you and it's like prejudice almost like going to work no one wants to go to work and say well i've got chronic depression i have high anxiety um i suffer with overthinking and whatever that might be that they find that they think they have no one wants to go to work to saying that to the man manager right so well you're not going to say that in your interview let alone do you see what I mean? You know, you're not, if you're interviewing for that role and position, mm. yeah. those are the sorts of things that you wouldn't say to anyone, you know? Absolutely. You wouldn't think that, but what yeah. if there was not a non-judgmental approach from yeah, the manager? Yeah. So what if you said, yeah, I got all these skills and assets, but also this is what you call your shadow side to, to a human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what, what I am at the moment. And if they can go, okay, well, let's see how we can work around this. What do you need from us to help you with this job? Yeah. And that's just in a work environment. Yeah, I, I I do think, and I'm not saying it's prevalent and it's like widespread, but there are some of the larger corporates that are starting to think that way. Mm. You know, like mm. neurodiversity is mm. more of a superpower than a hindrance, for example. So probably one of the most famous ones I know is Microsoft mm. in the fact that they employ, they've got a team of autistic people mm. doing a lot of coding. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, they might not be great, let's say, in interaction or you've got to understand how to interact, mm. but they're phenomenal in execution. Yeah. And so it's seeing those what were perceived disadvantages and saying, how do we get the best out of that person, even mm. though they don't fit a conventional mold? Mm. And that always naturally then brings me on to the education system. Mm. I'm quite a, a, a big storyteller around that because I feel that one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my wife worked in a special needs department mm -hmm. in a large secondary school. Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately the kids that were in there weren't always bad kids they just didn't process information in the same way. Absolutely. You know, yeah. they, they can't sit yeah. still for eight hours. They, they need to be doing stuff. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and it's like, well, we'll give you a label and then we'll give you some pills to suppress it oh, yeah. and you can move on. And, and it's so funny because I ran a football team for five years and um, when I was running the football team, one of the kids in the football team um, 
Claire obviously knew the person from the special needs. Mm. So she walked in and his face went white like, don't say anything. But, like, sh- but it was <laughs> such a stigma to, to him and everyone else finding out because he yeah. felt that it all take the mickey out of it. Yeah. But it wasn't the case. It was like it, my wife had seen him grow as a person and even in the football team he was one of the personalities of the team very confident very like out there you know chatty and whatever else mm, mm. but in the environment that he was in they wanted the opposite they wanted him quiet they wanted you know like and it's like you're not celebrating the personality and it, mm. you could view it always oh, being troublesome it's like well no if you took time mm. to understand he mm. could be the life and soul of the classroom if you had allowed him to yeah and so for me that that neurodiversity the understanding of personality traits that a lot of a lot of stuff comes out in coaching mm. is sadly missing in the education system. Mm. And so therefore, you know, hearing stuff like Simon Postle's way and, and, and other people making an impact in that level, I think then we'll have a better schooling system. Yeah. That absolutely. in turn has better people. Yeah. And it in turn allows people to have that conversation that they're not having at the moment. As you said, they're hiding it rather than dealing with, you know, putting it out there and say, look, this is who I am. Mm. I'm not going to act. Yeah. Um, but you need to make a choice if I fit or not. Mm, exactly that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's again, it, how we can communicate that. How can we express that in terms of knowing how to use, like I said, being able to be who you are, mm-hmm. neurodivergent or not. You know, it's really important to be able to. So, so you, so just go back to your story then. Yeah. So you done a lot of different jobs, got a lot of experiences and yeah. stuff like that. And then obviously you can work for someone, but you may, maybe a braver decision to say hey i'm going to be an entrepreneur as well because life isn't difficult enough is that is that kind of where you got to i love the word brave thank you it's <laughs> actually a nightmare as well as with you yeah yeah be honest with you i'm naturally being taught how to take orders working in work jobs 14 jobs different seven careers you know yeah. i'm so used to having managers and supervisors tell me what to do and i got i got a target i've got a, a area to go into and I, I'm, I'm there being self i say self-diagnosed but understanding what how it works i've got quite a neurodivergent brain okay so being focused on just the one two three tasks is really difficult but as as you know entrepreneur you do balance and juggle lots of plates which works for me yeah but also i need a lot of like structure to be able to make that work yeah Uh, or i forget about a lot of those plates that's fallen down about a month ago you know um but that's just the venture i'm going into and like see having your own business in, in, in coaching it's like all right so i know who i am check yeah i know what i want to do check yeah what do i need to do to get there okay well, there's a few gray areas that i need to work out you know and there's so much distraction out there so many people tell you how to do something and then contradict themselves yeah, yeah. um so i'm constantly just going okay right i'm going to still do me except that i'm going to make mistakes along the way but also love where i am love yeah. the journey because we forget to love the journey in between but Mm. that's the happiness bit but try not to get confused with all the confusion and understanding of how what makes it happen because we get caught up in the the result rather than the actual activity yeah i and and i think the the general being for most people is coaching is i set my goal Mm -hmm. i achieve the goal and then i can succeed and i'm happy Mm -hmm. but from what you're saying there is is like no enjoy the journey Mm enjoy the learning mm. while you're going through it yeah so it'd be like the best way to say it's like you're making a movie but mm. you don't enjoy the movie until it's been done mm. which is quite you go well that's you should enjoy the process right absolutely you know the filming the interviewing or whatever it may be the subject matter that you're doing the research yeah. but in life in general we go well i can't enjoy it until i'm at the end of the the goal mm. Yet in our work, particularly if it's something that we enjoy, mm. we enjoy the process. Mm. But certainly, I think maybe it's a disease with entrepreneurs is that we don't enjoy that. We don't enjoy the meeting new people or the relationships or allow ourselves because maybe it's the finance that we've always got our eye on or where it's the results of making, mm. you know, the big contract or the big deal. But mm. for me, it's it's about enjoying the journey, 100%, enjoying the process of yeah. discovery and connecting. yeah. That, and, and learning to live in the failure you know yeah love failure you know because that again that you there's so much more you learn from it right yeah and that, as you know it's that's how you learn but it's knowing what you also are good at is important 
Yeah. Because that helps you enjoy the journey because you can steer towards that your skill set, more, like your values, for example. I love meeting people. Mm -hmm. I love humans. Yeah. Like, that's a fantastic networking group. And I fell in love with like meeting these amazing entrepreneurs and other coaches. I love doing that. If I could do that as a, as a just do that every day, it'd be amazing. Yeah. But you've got to make sure you do the other things around it too. So not to get, like I said, too distracted with that. Yeah. Um, and also like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's how you can overcome it and settle with it and just know that you're it's still a human it, as in you're going to make mistakes. So Yeah, yeah. I think the, the main thing for me is understanding that as an entrepreneur, there, if there are going to be ups and downs and that the mm. skill is learning to live in this sort of like middle level yeah. where it's not too up and not too down. That's it. And and things can change quick. You know, one minute it's like this. And that. I mean, you have to learn how quickly things can change. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. like you'll be going, you're doing one thing here and then it all changes and then something else comes in or you're chasing that contract there and that closes and then something else comes, you mm. know. And I think it's just learning to deal with that. But also, I think you have to take time out mm. because I think you cannot physically continue to do that all the time mm. you do need to take some time out you mm. know and that's where the good thing is having a coach for example is mm. you can decompress you can play cards and then you can say, okay mm. so let's remind each other of what the goal was yes you know where yes. we want to head what we want to do what we want to achieve yeah um and that's what it's given me when i've been coached is that i've had that ability to decompress to talk about that and mm. and even you know, coach that I worked with for over the pandemic, a brilliant guy. Mm. Um, and uh, it was more about just celebrating the wins. That was the thing you always used to ram home to me and say, look, you don't celebrate the wins, do you? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I was like, you just told me 15 things that are amazing to celebrate, yeah. but you're already thinking about 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. He said, celebrate that. And like, what do you mean by celebrating? Well, I oh, know, just have a cup of coffee around. Yeah. Well done. Or buy yourself a cake or just get yourself a shirt or do something that just marks the occasion. And mm. I think that was probably the biggest learning for me. And when everyone talks about it, Ollie, who's in humans, obviously mm. co founded with him, mm. that always comes up, you know, about celebrating the wins. Because I know I'm more of a futurist. So I, I'm always looking to the next thing yeah. by definition. So I have to sometimes pull myself back to. <laughs> enjoy mm. enjoy the now so from your perspective then working with business owners leaders entrepreneurs is that, is that kind of have you got a sort of flavor or who do you find you work best with um i work best with i think i do work best my my background is children and young adults okay. but they're not my clients at the moment right which is interesting um i work with those are in between stages. So like from like, uh, they've left a job going to, or going into a job. Mm -hmm. Those are either or, or relationships as well, because I'm still almost finding my real niche. My niche is work of neurodivergent yep. people, um, helping them find clarity yep. and connect to something that's important to them. Through that process, I've had a mixture of different clients that just happened to attract because there's, a, there's aspects of me that they see that works for them. Yeah. You know, because I'm a yeah. creative. I okay. get some creative sometimes. I, I'm quite, um, uh, I guess I'm just enjoy a lot of different sports or I might be um, understanding their local community, mm -hmm. which is like people that can familiarize with the here and now and where I am. Yeah. So it, it's it's it mixture, but I it's it's a really hard question to be honest with you, Dale, because mm. I feel like you shouldn't ever be able to be the coach for everyone because you you know it's confusing for everyone. So I'm still trying to find what is it that is like the the only client I'm ever gonna work with. But for me, that's I don't think that's gonna work because I feel like I can support other people in their areas of life because it's perspective, yeah. it's their own journey, they're independent or individual. How can you say that you can't until you, I, I can't coach a, a, you know, a CEO from, you know, a startup or a yeah. big company because that's not my field. Definitely not. There's a, there's a lot of things I cannot do mm -hmm. because that's, but I feel like there's a, there's a foundation of when you coach of a belief or system or a structure that I can support at the foundation level mm -hmm. until I go, okay, I'm definitely going to do that specific client. Definitely. 
Yeah, I I I, I teach I teach a lot of people around niching because I think mm. there's a lot of misunderstanding around niching. And what do I mean by that? So I use an example. If your niche was schools during the pandemic, mm. you're probably not in business now. Mm-hmm. Because it was such a big thing and all the schools were shut. Mm. All the schools shut all their budgets off. And then there was an auxiliary, a bunch of people around the yeah. schools, like after school clubs and stuff like that, yeah. that would shut down because they've got no kids to coach because they're not allowed outside, for example, or yeah. allowed to engage with coaches. Now, I use that as an example because that's what happened to us. But our, fa- uh, our saving grace is that we were a bit diverse. Yeah. And that wasn't our only niche, no. as in education. So I say to people, you need to have a niche around a niche around something that you've made a reputation in that you're good at. Mm. You know, you know the, the industry, you're good at delivering, you've got a track record. So mm. that will naturally emerge. So for instance, we were working with we still do work with schools. Yeah. Um and and that was great. But you should also then have a healthy interest in another area. Mm-hmm. So you have your main say let's say your niche yeah you then have what i call is another niche where you it's something that you're interested in but mm-hmm. you need to build some experience up in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you know enough that the principles will work in that industry so now you've got two niches yeah and then the third one is something emergent something that you know in an ideal world it's a bit left field but you're really interested in it and you're actually mm-hmm. a bit passionate about yeah and so for me that worked as we've got education I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, the coaching person, uh, personal development, I really enjoyed. So we ended up doing a lot of work with companies in property, educating people on property as a result of it. And then the, the sort of like the emergent stuff was tech. Okay. So working with tech companies, trying to realize an idea like an MVP. And mm-hmm. what come out mm-hmm. of the pandemic is we got so good in that tech emergent thing, that became a software company. So sometimes by having those the free tiered approach for niching you can actually develop other products sure and so like now obviously when schools come back online we're still there we're still doing great stuff you know we're working so that's how i met simon for example and and that came because our core's still there and we knew it would come back on because we we're coming out of covid yeah we just carry on but now we've got an established secondary market and we've now got another company I've, I've got another company that's in software yeah. which also works quite closely with creation in terms of if you're building a product you're also going to need a brand yeah. to get tell the story so it's a case of having free areas mm. in your business mm. it protects you from being so niched that you can fail so what makes this common the common thing is the principles and the processes that we use so we're famous for the tools that we use mm-hmm. first and foremost like the purpose playbook and stuff like that yeah yeah rather than we just work with gray-haired people on the ages of 45 <laughs> to 50 who like walking dogs you know you can go that deep if you want to yeah, and there yeah. might be a there might be a niche for it but mm-hmm. i'm saying yeah but what happens if all dogs get diseases then and then they're all gone now you're stuffed mm-hmm. you know so you, it's just understanding that i think the whole niche on pick one thing and be amazing at it Mm. i think is old and obviously the pandemic really got us to think a little bit more about diversifying looking a little bit wider to then mitigate the risks Mm. that makes sense absolutely so so that's like a smart way of doing it so like for instance your your background might be neurodiverse but it might be neurodiversity in education but also in corporates mm. but also you're looking at a tech product that had you given the same tools and mm. treatments and techniques without you being in the room that would be a smart way to build the business does that make sense yeah absolutely i appreciate that and um that has yeah that's totally i totally relate with that absolutely because then you're not trapped because i think often and particularly you mentioned you're creative so often creatives like oh i feel trapped now <laughs> yeah exactly i'm going to enjoy this business and now i can only work with these people you've yeah. made the rule up mm. and you've now pincered yourself in this thing mm. i don't even enjoy the company i am because i can't be creative mm. well if you build your company around those three things mm. now you can go so say you want to be a bit more creative you'll spend more time in the tech side of things yeah you know or say that you you want to just just get the juices flowing of in a new area and feel a little bit uncomfortable working in the industry you're not used to. But mm. let's say you need a bit more comfort and you know what pays the bills, so to speak, then you've got your mm. core 
you know core product that you know that you can always deliver on with your eyes shut in a way because it's you of course because you're used to so yeah that's how i teach around niche and i can't remember what i called it but it was it was a case of it's a it's it's slightly wider than just being one mm. it's free and mm. i mean that has made all the difference mm. for me as a business because we learned the hard way in the fact that we did have a lot of education clients and people connected to it but thankfully yeah. because i did the other stuff it was just because i was heavily involved in networking as well mm. i then pivoted into the, net, the networking and helped people on personal development because that's what was going on people mm. were investing heavily in it mm. um and we picked up some more tools like the challenge model and, mm. and that sort of stuff and video teaching yeah. from being open to do things slightly differently yeah that's great no it's, that sounds exciting yeah so um from your perspective so we've got the um We've got the aspect of coaching individuals and niching that we've touched on. But what about you? So what would you say to someone that's never been coached before? What, 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 what would they, what, what to expect? What, what does a coach look like? Because we know what maybe a sporting coach is. What, what do you <laughs> think you, to people that have not been involved in coaching, what's that like? As from me or do you mean from uh, my perspective on? Speaking to a prospect or client. So a okay. client comes to okay. you, right. never had never had coaching before. Hi Ross, sound like a cool guy. Kind of interested in what you do. What what do I expect working with you? So for me, you'd probably expect just a compassionate, patient, really good listener that will hear you and see you in the way that no one else has. I'd be able to understand that actually what you're going through is somewhat difficult. Mm -hmm but there's other ways we can look at it and help you look at perspectives and look at how we can go through that and change directions. It's your habits, you know, your paradigm, for example, and understand what those things are and go through like a very foundational, easy to learn and understand process. Yeah. So you can feel comfortable and safe. And what, what sort of tools do you have in your arsenal of toolkit have you got any tools you want to give away or you know, for, <laughs> for the listener something they something they could do let's say they're feeling anxious yes and they're frustrated mm -hmm. is there anything they can do from the words of yourself that could actually help them in a process like that what would you mm. what would you give to them yeah as a so takeaway? going back down to basics um what do they need what makes them feel safe they're anxious uh, they're thinking so much about what's that what's happened or what could happen not here and now yeah so if i'm with them let them just express what it is mm -hmm. so they're being seen and being heard go through some breathing mm -hmm. and then use a tool that might help them understand who they are first make sure you ask the right questions because i wouldn't go into any session not knowing who they are yeah yeah so you, you'd listen up for like okay so do they like playing games so let's, let's let's get some games let's play some cards Let's, let's have a chat about what else that's going on in their life that they enjoy. Take away from this current initial problem, their belief, their worry, mm. and get them down to the who they are and then go, okay, step back into it. Because it's like pull and take, push and pull, push and pull. Mm -hmm. If you go straight in with the problem, okay, so I can see it's going to potentially double the anxiety because you're already talking about what they're worried about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it is anxiety. And then, then you're patient with them. And then reminding them that they're safe. Yeah. Reminding them that they're they're okay. Mm. You know, touch touch yourself in in a way that's compassionate. Yeah. I, I I um I do a lot of hold onto your heart and tap your heart, mm. Just tap your heart. And if you, uh, do, do, you know, tapping or mm. um, it's something that you can do physically that can take them here and now. You know, it, it's you know all the tapping that yeah you, you know of. It's it's a very like physical and emotional and also biochemistry. We like we don't forget about that. Like, what is our biochemistry doing? So, stand up with them. Yeah. And I would go cool, and just say, look, we're gonna stand up together for five seconds and step back down again. Wow. Okay. And they go okay, and they're like, what's that? What's that for? And again, how do you feel? Oh, I feel a bit confused a bit, and then they start talking about how other feelings. Yeah. It takes away the feeling that they're feeling anxiety again, and then we get back onto a level. That helps to communicate. So we, so yeah. it's it's um, it's a bit like pa passing a ball. It's like football. Yeah. You're passing a ball to them to give them a an um, an option to think about something or a feeling. Yeah. Or a subject. 
and then you and they pass it back by you've got the ball so you've got the next tool to use but understanding that where they are here and now it's um i can never really answer it in, in, in a very straight answer no no it's fine it's because because that makes sense yeah no it does because i i remember reading a um i remember reading a story about peter shilton he was an ex-England goalkeeper. He's probably one mm. that had the most caps for England. Mm. And he said there would be times in a game where his mind would drift. And often, you know, it's probably well, if they score now or if I make a mistake or whatever. Mm. And he he had this technique where he'd pinch his thigh. Yeah. And he said there are some games by the end of it, his thigh would be bruised. <laughs> Cause he, but he yeah, was yeah. doing it to say, snap out of it, focused in the moment. Here and because now. if you keep worrying about conceding the goal, mm -hmm. guess what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You're going to be stood in the wrong place and they're going to chip you and you're going to look stupid and you'll be all over the papers. Yeah. So his technique was he would pinch his thigh to mm. keep him in the present rather than, let's say, catastrophizing <laughs> about what could happen. Yeah. And obviously he became a very successful goalkeeper. Unfortunately, he didn't save any penalties in the semi-final of the world cup but you know <laughs> never mind but he was a he was a good guy but it was like again i think that's that when you are playing at a top level sport or, or there is a lot at stake then you have that propensity to think of what if the worst happens rather than what if the best happens what does that look like and just rewire your brain exactly. to think that's about it what if, what if success did happen and it mm -hmm. was good and mm -hmm. how would you celebrate? Oh, I can't go there because the worst might happen. Yeah, no, exactly. we need to re Where do you get that from? Yeah. Because actually the evidence is uh -huh. saying otherwise. That's it. You know, and I think that is a very common thing for us, mm. particularly like with social media and all this. We naturally hook onto the negativity, mm -hmm. you know, rather than the positivity mm. that can be there. And mm. as you said, you know, just making them feel safe. Mm. And hopefully we rewire them to think, hang on a second, mm. life can be good. Mm. So, so Ross, um, where where could we get in contact with you at the moment? So at the moment, I'm online. Yeah, so are you, you on LinkedIn? I am on LinkedIn, yes. Okay, good place to start. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Ross Matthews online. Um, uh, I think it's under Clarity and Connect or Confidence Coach, I think it also is there. Okay. Um, but you can find Ross Matthews. And then you can find me on Facebook, Ross Sean Matthews. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, I can follow that. You can follow my business page as well, which is um, Washington Matthews, Clarity Connect. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving us some clarity welcome. today. And um, for me, it's all about when you can give people clarity, they're going to have more confidence to engage. That's and obviously it. our conversation, hopefully mm -hmm. they've got to know you more. But thank you for spending the time on our sofa or on our new setup today. Thanks, Darren. I've been honoured. It's lovely. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Purpose People podcast. How you can help us is to like and subscribe our YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Google and Amazon. That helps us get our message out there to help people go after their dreams, double down on it and be successful in life on their terms.